Awesome. Hello, everybody. Share. And present. And share that. Share the real screen, which must exist somewhere on my desktop. And this hundreds of times, and it's still challenging. All right. So, uh, hello and welcome. Um, start out by saying that this presentation and most of the stuff that I share uh, is licensed under Creative Commons, so feel free to take it. Uh, and use it within your own organization if you feel it's useful. I posted a link to the slides uh, in the Q&A, uh, so you can grab it from there, or if you've got a camera handy, you can grab it from uh, the pretty little picture on your screen. Um, this is kind of a follow-on from a presentation that I did a year ago, uh, talking about uh, it had a catchier title, uh, which was Flickr or Fireball, um, but again, it was really around design considerations in implementing Fire. Uh, so you might want to take a look at that one as well if you didn't have the pleasure of being there and you haven't had a chance to see it yet. Um, last year, what I talked about were four key points. Um, first was that when you're implementing Fire, really try to do REST when you can. Uh, and the rationale for that is that REST is intrinsically scalable uh, and also generally uh, use case agnostic, which means that you can implement the interface and use that same interface to solve a whole bunch of different problems, including ones that you didn't realize that you had or weren't setting it to solve at the time that you rolled out the interface initially, whereas some of the other ways of using Fire can certainly solve your initial problem, but aren't necessarily going to scale as well to, to lows further down uh, timeline. Second is be permissive. So don't uh, restrain people from sending what data that they have, even if you don't necessarily care. Uh, as much as possible, just ignore the stuff that you don't care about, rather than telling them not to send it to you, because you want as much as you can. Uh, to have people implement a single fire interface that is the fi their fire interface to the world. And then other people come in and look at that uh, and gather what they need to. It's much cheaper that way, much more efficient that way, and much more likely uh, that people will do what you want um, if they don't have to create a custom interface just for you. Third thing we talked about uh, is that fire introduces new ways of information sharing. So even though you might have been used to always sharing information in a particular way, um, to look beyond what you might be used to uh, and uh, see what the other options are, because some of them might actually be better, uh, either in terms of meeting your use case requirements uh, or in terms of um, being cheaper and easier for the community to work with and therefore more likely to actually interoperate with you. Uh, which brings us to the fourth point, which is the community is what matters. Uh, both in terms of seeking feedback from the community at large uh, as you are developing uh, your interface to make sure that it meets their needs, but also thinking about what is going to be the simplest and cheapest solution for everybody, uh, not just your own organization, uh, because thinking that way makes life easier for everyone uh, and increases the chances of interoperability. So those are the things that I talked about last time around. This time, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to talk a little bit more about the use REST wherever you can, um, but in a slightly different context. Um, and the context is there's actually a whole bunch of different types of REST and a whole bunch of types, different types of other ways of sharing. And so how do you actually come to a decision about what is the way that you want to share? So this particular presentation had a fairly generic name because I hadn't figured out what I was going to talk about when I told Rianne, sure, I'll talk something about architecture. Um, but the topic that we're going to uh, chat about today uh, originated probably last 
November-ish uh, as part of the Da Vinci Project. And Da Vinci is one of the uh, HL7 fire accelerators. It's focused on getting better data uh, sharing between payers uh, and providers and, and patients and, and making the whole process of prior authorization and adjudication and claims and payments and all those wonderful things flow more smoothly. Uh, and DaVinci has been busy. We have roughly 20-ish implementation guides now, uh, which is pretty impressive because DaVinci itself has been running, I think, less than two years. Um, but with 20 different implementation guides, uh, they weren't all written by me, thank God. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different people writing implementation guides. Um, and whenever you have a whole bunch of different people working uh, somewhat independently, they come up with different solutions to similar problems. Uh, something we had uh, an issue with in the early days of fire, and to a certain extent still have some challenges with in the design of the fire resources, um, but it's certainly something that we saw in the DaVinci implementation guides where we had similar problems that we were solving in different ways. And when people came and asked us why, or alternatively, when they weren't necessarily looking across implementation guides, they were just looking at one, they would still ask us why. Why did you use this technology and not that technology or something else? And we didn't always have a great set of answers. And so we thought, you know what? We should probably undertake a bit of analysis and look at what are the different options and provide some guidance around what should be used in what circumstances. Uh, because we were sort of far enough along in, in the fire story that it was reasonable uh, to have something like that in place. So we dug. Um, a lot of different ways uh, to ask for information to be shared, to cause information to be shared uh, in the fire space. Uh, the current count is 21 different approaches, and that's conservative, uh, because if you take into account, uh, well, if I do RESTful search, I can do that in synchronous or asynchronous. Right now, I'm counting that as one, but it's actually a fairly different uh, architecture uh, and uh, workflow to make uh, the asynchronous part happen, then that's a whole bunch more. Um, one a couple of the mechanisms are using either communication request or task to ask somebody uh, to provide information to you. And there's a whole section in the FireSpec on workflow uh, with many different ways that you can ask somebody to fulfill uh, a communication request. And so that adds more. So there are a lot of ways of sharing information in the fire space which is awesome because uh, we set out to try to provide some flexibility uh, in how to meet use cases and to meet a wide variety of use cases and each of these approaches is there because it satisfies a need but first of all most people when they say i want to implement fire have no clue that there are all these different choices out there uh, and second of all if they come to realize what the full breadth of the choices are we have given them very little guidance in terms of how to choose amongst the possibilities so there's a lot of waiting and a lot of guessing and a lot of decision making without much guidance and that's not ideal so how do you actually choose between uh, all of these different approaches there's a few things you can look at uh, one of them uh, is, does that particular mechanism of sharing lend itself to uh, either reuse or uh, applicability in multiple purposes? Um, that's something that we try to achieve as much as we can with Fire. If you build an interface, it's kind of nice if that interface is not only going to meet your immediate use case, but is also going to meet ones uh, that you're going to have later and won't just satisfy the requirements of one client, but will satisfy the requirements of a whole bunch of clients, including some that you didn't even realize that you were going to have, but are going to show up in a year or two or five, being interested in that, in that kind of information. Um, and so we can take a look at something like RESTful Search, where you say, I'm going to let you search my allergies, or I'm going to let you search my encounters. And that is quite uh, reusable. Anybody who is interested in your allergy information can use those search criteria to find the allergies that are relevant for whatever their purpose is, whether it's research or clinical care uh, or, or something else. Um, whereas if you look at uh, a messaging interface, those tend to be a little bit uh, tighter uh, and uh, perhaps uh, less easy to evolve and require much more negotiation uh, to get set up 
uh, between a client system and a server system. So when somebody else comes along with a slightly different reason for using the information, the chances that a defined messaging interface is going to work for that other purpose as well is not necessarily non-existent, but it's lower. Uh, and so we can go through and evaluate the different approaches on that basis. Uh, something else that's really important uh, when you're designing is what are other people actually supporting? Uh, because we have a whole bunch of capabilities that exist in the fire spec that haven't necessarily penetrated industry much. And some of them might not ever penetrate industry. We think it's a good idea. Uh, we've at least created proof of concept implementations, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the community at large is going to start rolling it out and that you're going to see lots of the systems that you're wanting to partner with to be able to share data being capable of using those technologies. So that is also something uh, that you would want to evaluate. So things like uh, restful search are pretty much all over the place. Not everybody supports them, but most systems support them. Whereas something like GraphQL has not really gotten off the ground yet. We have some excellent reference implementations, but I have not seen uh, that in production, certainly not in production in very many places. And so that may also be uh, something to evaluate on. And so we tried to capture um, some general uh, assertions around both reusability and adoption uh, as considerations when you're evaluating. Uh, but of course, that isn't sufficient because when you look at this snippet of the chart that's on the screen, uh, RESTful search and batch search and transactions and several other things both qualify as highly reusable. If you build that interface, you'll be able to use it for a whole bunch of other things without necessarily writing new code. And adoption, most uh, implementations nowadays have capabilities of, of doing these, at least to some extent. And so how do you choose amongst those options? And for that, we need to look at the use cases. And we built a decision tree. And that is the decision tree. Um, or at least that is the decision tree as of now, because it continues to grow and evolve as we get feedback. And yes, it really is that big and ugly, and that's kind of what happens when you've got 21 plus different approaches to sharing data. Obviously, you can't read that, so let's take a look at it a little bit more closely. Um, so you start out, uh, and the very first question is essentially push versus pull. So is this something that is initiated within the consumer system or is initiated within uh, the data source system? And that's going to drive a whole lot of um, what your decision points are. And then you continue to go down through the tree uh, and eventually get to one of those nice green boxes uh, that says, here is the recommendation. Now, in some of those cases, um, the answer is going to be pretty clear. So is this, is this the driver for the information being shared, something that lives uh, or gets triggered in the system that ends up with the data or the system that starts with the data? You're going to be pretty clear on that in terms of your use case. But there are other questions uh, like, are, do you want to return full-blown resources or do you want to return individual data elements? Or sometimes the answer is, I don't really care. I mean, if you give me my data in resources, that's fine. I'll go and pick the data elements that I want out of that. And if you give me it as a collection of uh, data elements, that's fine too. Um, it doesn't matter. And in those cases, you may need to follow both sides of the tree to figure out, um, based on where you eventually end up, which of these are more appropriate for me uh, based on some of the other considerations like um, how reusable is it or how widely implemented is it or other things. Uh, something else from the tree is that even when you get to one of those nice little green boxes, you're not necessarily done. Uh, so as an example, on the left-hand side, uh, we have you ending up either using communication or task, but then you hit another case or another box which basically says, go and loop back up to this thing up here called B, which is a whole other portion of the graph that says, once you have uh, sent that uh, communication request or task and said, hey, I would love it if some human being would go in and gather this information for me, you then have to decide how are you gonna get it back, uh, which is some sort of a push response, and you need to define which of those options you're gonna have. So in addition to having these 21 different ways of sharing, 
some of them end up actually using combinations. Uh, and so there's a, even many more, uh, probably over 100 ways of combining uh, these different mechanisms into a communication solution. A uh, few things to keep in mind about the guidance that I'm going to be sharing with you. Uh, it is not normative. Nobody is going to come to you and yell at you and say, you didn't use CDS hooks for that, uh, so you can't call yourself fire conformant. We are not at that point, and we probably never will be. Uh, we have tools available, and what tool is appropriate, uh, at least in terms of conformance with the base fire standard, is generally going to be pretty wide open. There will certainly be implementation guides. Uh, they will drive you towards a particular solution and demand uh, that you support a particular set of functionality in a particular way. But in the base fire standard, you have all of these mechanisms, it can choose the one that, that makes the most sense for you. Um, and you're going to be influenced not just by this decision tree, but you're going to be influenced by what are your existing database capabilities, um, what is your legacy mechanism for exchange in terms of interface engines and all of that wonderful technology, authorization, et cetera? Um, maybe you're a government department and that government department uh, or the body above it has dictated specific architectural standards in terms of how data shall be shared uh, and you kind of need to follow those, although you might want to nudge and poke a little bit and see if you can get them to evolve uh, into something resembling this century because not all of them necessarily do resemble this century. Um, you will have people who prefer different things. Some people like documents, some people like messaging, uh, and so that will influence. Um, but your biggest influence should be what are the people you want to talk to do? Uh, because if you try to share ways, information in ways that align with that, you're much more likely to get adoption more quickly um, or ever uh, than if you choose an approach that differs from what your communication partners uh, are used to and comfortable with. So let's take a look at some of the decision points. Um, first one is pretty obvious. Uh, do you want to pull the data? So as a data consumer, I'm going to initiate the flow and say, I would like some set of information from uh, this data source. Um, or are you going to have it pushed where the initiation happens on the data source side that says, hey, something cool has happened in my space and I have decided based on the fact that this new record was created or some state transition occurred uh, or somebody pushed a button or the clock takes across to midnight that I should push data out. Uh, to some deserving uh, data consumer. Um, and one caveat with this decision is that it's not about who actually sends the first electronic message, but it's where does the trigger event happen. So something like polling, where you on a regular basis say, hey, is there anything new? Is there anything new? Is there anything new? And then eventually get a response back that yes, there's something new and here it is. From the purpose of the decision tree, uh, that is considered to be a push because it is an event in the data source system that determines when you're actually going to get information. The fact that you're continuously checking uh, doesn't mean that you're in control of when data is actually going to flow. I mean, you have some control over the timing of it, but the, the general gist is you're going to get it relatively soon after it happens, depending on your polling frequency. When you actually have information that shows up in your system is going to be driven by the data source. Uh, Something that is unfortunately still uh, relevant and is likely to be relevant in the fire space for a good long time is sometimes we need to have humans uh, involved in the process of, of gathering data. And that can be for a whole bunch of different reasons. Uh, sometimes um, the electronic system that you're talking to just does the available, the data available electronically. So maybe it's only in paper records and you need a human to go digging through the file cabinet to find them. Um, and scan them so it can be transmitted to you electronically. Um, sometimes it might be in some external third-party system. Sometimes you just have no idea wh where the data actually lives. So in the Da Vinci circumstance, uh, we have, you need occasionally to say, please give me supporting information for this claim uh, that demonstrates that the patient has this condition or that you've done X or whatever. But that supporting information could exist in numerous forms. Maybe it exists as a scanned PDF with minimal metadata. Maybe it exists 
I as a condition record or a lab result or uh, a pathology report. It could be many different things and it could be stored in all sorts of different ways uh, in different document types, maybe it's in CDA, all sorts of uh, various ways that information could exist. And it's really hard for the data consumer, the system that wants the data to have a clue where to go looking, but presumably, hopefully, uh, there are human beings on the data source side uh, that will have a better understanding of where that information is and have the uh, incentive to go digging it up and find it uh, and relay that. Uh, and there's also a consideration of how comfortable with the, uh, the uh, data consumer actually wading through all of the data that you have looking for what they want are you. Um, in the Da Vinci space, the answer is quite often not very uh, because there isn't a huge amount of trust always between uh, the payers and the providers or that, for that matter between the payers and the patients. Uh, and so the notion of a payer coming in and just re reading through all of the healthcare data that exists on the patient looking for the information that's relevant to a specific uh, question that they have is not necessarily a viable choice. And so having uh, a human uh, intermediary uh, who looks and says, yes, this is actually reasonable to go back and is appropriate based on the circumstances of the question is something uh, that can absolutely drive uh, information sharing. Um, that said, if you can get the humans out of the equation, that's always better because uh, it means that it's faster, uh, it means that it's more consistent, uh, and it certainly means that it's cheaper. Uh, next consideration is, are you interested in receiving uh, resources or individual data elements? Um, in FHIR, we typically want to operate on resources because that is how we've defined our standard, and most of the information that we want to share has context where a single element by itself isn't going to make a whole lot of sense, and once you separate that element out, uh, it kind of loses its context and loses the ability to then be shared uh, subsequently downstream. But uh, there are situations where uh, you don't want necessarily everything in a resource. You'd want five different data elements and they're from five different resources and you really don't want five full-blown resources and all of their data just those five elements. And so you'll be driven uh, to different exchange mechanisms. We have technologies like GraphQL uh, that are more amenable to this than a simple uh, fire search. Uh, we do have the elements parameter, but just some limitations around that. Uh, if you are uh, in a push situation um, where you are going to decide as the data source what consumers are going to receive information and when they're going to receive it, you might be deciding, but you may be deciding that based on configuration from the data consumer. And realistically, you're always going to be deciding that to a certain extent based on configuration from the data consumer. You're not going to just arbitrarily look up uh, some system on the internet and say, you know what, I think I'm going to start sharing uh, lab data with you today. There will obviously be out of band uh, coordination around what data is being sent to whom. But it is possible in FHIR to electronically configure uh, what information is going to flow. So using either polling or something like subscription, you can determine what information is going to come uh, from the data source to the consumer, even though it's the data source that determines when that data was going to flow. If you are doing push, another consideration is does the data source have control over or try to specify what uh, is actually going to be stored uh, in the data consumer system? So are you going to say, I want you to actually create this allergy or update this encounter? Or are you going to say, here's some allergy information, here's some encounter information, do with it as you see fit. Um, both of those are completely viable, but FHIR says that there are different ways to ask for those different kinds of things to happen. If you're doing a RESTful post or a RESTful put uh, with a create or an update, you're essentially saying, please store this and persist it as I'm sending it to you. There's some wiggle room in terms of you don't necessarily have to store every, all of the data elements you're given, but there is an expectation that if you say, okay, uh, a 201 response to a post, that you have indeed persisted the record uh, that you've been given. On the other hand, if I send you a message equivalent of a version two 
uh, ADT message that says, here's an encounter and a bunch of stuff, I have no clue whether you're actually going to store any of that data or what you're going to do with it, and I don't much care. I've satisfied my requirements to give you the encounter information, and what you do with it from that point forward is really up to you. Um, another consideration is, are you talking about data that already exists? in the data source, or are you asking for data to be generated or invented? Uh, we make, there's no real way to search uh, for things like what is your average blood pressure over the last month as of today. We have to do that either with a message or an operation. Same sort of thing, uh, what is uh, the set of SNOMED codes that meet this value set as of now in the UK, uh, because the answer to that is going to be different uh, if you ask it two months two weeks from now, or if you ask it in Australia or something else, that isn't necessarily a persisted uh, answer, and so you need to generate that information, and that is also going to drive uh, what approach you use to gathering data in FHIR. If you're pushing information to a system, most commonly we just pass individual resources, so here's an encounter, here's an allergy, uh, here is uh, a condition or, or whatever, um, although we might choose to pass them as a collection for efficiency purposes. But sometimes you don't not only want to pass them as a collection, uh, you want them stored as a collection. So I want to give you this encapsulated document uh, that tells a story. And that story is essential to what I'm conveying. So you need to not only store the individual records, but you need to store them as a collective and pass them around as a collective uh, so that that story is retained. So whether that's a pathology report or a discharge summary, summary, having that table of contents that tells the story and presents information in a particular way matters. And there are a whole lot of situations where that doesn't matter. Uh, and so even though you might have used CDA documents in the past to share the information, it wasn't really around storytelling. It was around that this is a syntax we have. And as you move into FHIR, you realize that, well, I can have a syntax without necessarily having the overhead and the expectations associated with the document. And so that's not going to matter as much. Uh, and then, of course, we have synchronous versus asynchronous. So when I send a question and say, can you give me uh, all of the lab results of type XYZ for this patient um, and get back a response, most of the time I want that to be synchronous because uh, there are a whole lot more use cases that are satisfied by a synchronous interface than one that takes time. If I'm uh, trying to uh, implement a CDS hook service, uh, I need my responses uh, from the EHR really quickly because I'm doing real-time decision support. I need to present the card uh, to the user as they are writing the referral or they are writing the prescription passing him a message 10 minutes later after the patient's already walked out the door that, oh, by the way, uh, here are five questions that you need to have answered uh, from the patient uh, in order for this referral to work is not terribly helpful. But uh, when you're accessing large volumes of data or when your persistence layer happens to be slow or you've got humans involved or you're gathering data from a whole bunch of different systems, uh, then uh, asynchronous can be necessary. And so you need to decide um, which of those uh, approaches are going to work uh, in your environment, or you may need to actually support both. So try the question synchronously, and if there's a problem, if what you've asked for is too big or there's a decision that, yeah, we need to get the humans involved with that, then pass back the appropriate uh, HTTP response code that then tells the client that, okay, you can retry, but you're going to have to retry it asynchronously, and you won't necessarily get the data as quickly as you want, and you can decide whether or not that's going to meet your needs or not. Once you've gotten through sort of those general uh, philosophical approach questions, uh, the fun next question is really which of these technologies are going to meet your requirements? Um, if you're doing a poll, you're doing a search, there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing searches in FHIR. Uh, RESTful search is the most widely implemented uh, and the simplest, um, but you can also pass a batch of search. Um, and in fact, you can pass a batch that includes not only RESTful search, but also includes filters or operations or queries or other things. 
We have the filter mechanism, which is a more sophisticated search capability that isn't as widely implemented. You can define your own custom queries, which of course minimizes reuse and gives you tight um, control over exactly what's happened, and you can do fantastically complicated things uh, with very small interfaces. Uh, there's CQL, where you can actually write code that's going to go through this, the data and make a determination of whether it's part of the value set or not. Um, and then, of course, you can define your own custom operations or you can use messaging. Uh, if you want to pull individual data elements, we have GraphQL, we have Sparkle, CQL can do that as well. You should probably update this to note that you can actually use regular search so long as you're using the elements option and, of course, operations and messaging fit in there too. Uh, if you're talking about consumer-directed push, uh, where the consumer decides what's going to happen, you have polling, uh, which is very simple, um, but it tends to not necessarily be as efficient in terms of bandwidth uh, and can sometimes hammer on uh, the data source pretty hard if you're not careful. Um, or we have subscription, which requires more sophistication, a bit more architectural capability, but is much less in terms of bandwidth load uh, and, and overhead on the server. Um, but even within subscription, are you going to just send a notification that says, hey, there's data, come query to get it, or are you going to actually pass the data as part of the subscription response? And there are different security considerations around uh, each of those two options. And so uh, the same general architectural principle, uh, but different ways of making that happen. If, on the other hand, you're talking about source-directed push where it determines what's going to flow and when, there's the generic uh, RESTful create or update, uh, which is sort of the simplest way of doing things and relatively broadly supported. Um, but you can also look at batch or transactions if you want to send multiple things at once. Uh, you can do patch if you want to update a big resource without sending the entire thing. That's not as widely supported, but it's still pretty generic. Uh, or you could be passing around information as documents or uh, bundles of collection, uh, and you can use operations and messaging there as well. In fact, you can use operations and messaging pretty much wherever. Uh, they are pretty wide open in terms of what their capabilities are, um, but the challenge there is, of course, that they are tuned very much to the specific use case, uh, and they don't get as much uh, reuse as you might from some of the other technologies. So where are we going with all of this? Um, we started this discussion, like I said, in November. Uh, the content has been reviewed and discussed by a bunch of different work groups. I, we expect to publish the initial set of guidance uh, as part of uh, DaVinci's Atrux implementation guide sometime this summer. Uh, and our expectation is that the DaVinci IGs subsequent to that will point to that guidance uh, for some of the explanation about how do you do CBS hooks or how do you do polling, because uh, that doesn't really change uh, from use case to use case. Um, and also, uh, we use that decision tree to explain why they landed on the architectural approach that they did. Um, obviously, that's not going to be an expectation of non DaVinci IGs, but you're certainly welcome to do that if you want to, uh, and you might find it useful, and your implementers might find it useful to have that context. Uh, but the reality is that this guidance is not something that is specific to DaVinci or to pairs uh, and, and financial stuff. It's generic. And so our intention is to migrate this into uh, Fire R5, uh, where it'll be available to everyone as general guidance uh, and perhaps as a starting point uh, for uh, those who are uh, new to Fire and, and trying to figure out uh, what's going on. There's a hyperlink there to the draft. It is pretty draft. There's a whole bunch of places of, I've got a heading and not a lot of text yet, uh, but that will be fleshed out over the coming weeks uh, and we'll be fleshed out further as we get additional evaluation. There's actually a bunch of Google documents behind all of this where I'm grabbing content from, but it's uh, been re-architected a bit, so I'm taking some time to move all of that. Um, so we've got about five minutes for questions. Uh, so I don't know if there's anything been raised uh, in the question box so far, um, or just come off mute and ask. All right, thank you, Lloyd, for this interesting presentation. We have one question, might be a bit off topic, but could you talk a bit about when to use provenance 
should provenance resource be created every time a new resource is received or created? Um, the general recommendation is yes. Um, and that's, so you know, there's two pieces to it. Uh, one is, should you be capturing in your system that information about where did this data come from and what happened to it? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, in healthcare, you're, you're, you're not in good shape if you're not doing that. Um, but in terms of whether you should be exposing that provenance information, the answer is also generally yes. We're not very good at it yet. Um, but as we start sharing information more and more widely across organizations, across uh, jurisdictional boundaries, having that sense of context of, of where does this data come from, who created it, and in what circumstances is going to be really important to evaluating the data, especially as you, the record starts to actually include data not only from practitioners and specialists, but from patients uh, and other uh, caregivers because uh, their perspective matters too. It's been pretty clear on that this week. Um, then knowing where that data came from and understanding the context of that data is going to be in really important to evaluating it. Um, and so, yeah, the, the recommendation is that you should have that all the time. Now, whether that's always going to get shared whenever you query for information uh, is an open question, and we don't have as much support for it uh, in existing systems as we might like to have. So that's a growth area uh, in the fire space. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, I am a bit curious myself uh, about the migration to R5. Um, does that mean you have to uh, rework most of the implementation guides that are associated with the Vinci project? Um, it's not a have to. Uh, so, I mean, you can roll out an implementation guide in R4 and stick with R4 for the next five or six years if you want to. Uh, the choice to migrate to R5 or 6 or, or any future release is going to be driven by the needs of your community. Um, I mean, certainly the desire is eventually to get all of the FHIR implementations onto a normative release where we have much more uh, expectation of uh, introversion compatibility and where you can then evolve um, without worrying about things breaking so much. And that will be a happy place for us all to get to, but it's still going to take many years for us to get there for all of the standard clinical stuff and many more years uh, before we get there for some of the more sophisticated edge case stuff. Um, but yeah, if, you, if your community says, you know what, the R5 is looking good and it's made uh, these six out of our 10 resources normative, and so that's worth uh, the change that we can then be confident in stability for those things, uh, then yes, you will be looking at updating your implementation guides. Um, you may even want to do the same thing that we do with the fire core spec, which is define structure maps uh, that define the conversion process between your previous IG and your new one. In some cases, there may be minimal change. The resource might be looking largely the same or even identical uh, in R4 and R5, in which case you smile happily and say, yeah, uh, we were conformant before and we're still conformant and all is good. Uh, in other cases, the changes could be very radical. Uh, it depends very much on the resource and how stable it was uh, in R4 uh, and what the community feedback on it has been uh, that leads into R5. Thank you very much. I think we are out of time. There is one more question open, but maybe we can answer that later in the Q&A section. I will absolutely do that. I do expect to have lots of feedback uh, because architectural approaches are things that people are pretty passionate about. Um, and uh, there will be advocates for different approaches that will say, well, why did you uh, say this or, or why is this not appearing in a different part of the tree? And all of that feedback is welcome. Um, the intention is to have this EA consensus view of the community at large, and we don't get consensus without discussion. Uh, so please do engage in the workflow stream on chat.fire.org uh, or in ballot in, or in whatever other uh, way you find helpful. All right. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Have a great day, everybody. You guys too.